Yes, let's now bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to know your word so that we really know the truth about the true God. Oh Lord, you're the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And in the book of Daniel, we hear that you're the God of gods. We know that all the other gods are not gods, but Satan is there and he wants also to be worshipped. So help us, oh Father, today as we study your word. We want to worship you and you only. All of the idols, they are not gods. Some are made of wood. But Lord, we know that we are not warring against flesh and blood, but against the powers of the darkness. So protect us, O oh Father. And as we study now, May your angels be with us. May your Holy Spirit guide our minds that we may be able to understand your word and be wise and be your children, learning from you and being obedient to you. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Angels in the Glen. In this study, we're going to identify what the stone is, who the stone is, and what this great mountain that fills the whole earth. In the last study, we saw Daniel give King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of his dream. He sees a great image, a metal man, chest, head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And Daniel goes on to explain that these would be kingdoms. He said, you, O king, are the head of gold. But after you, another kingdom inferior will arise. And another kingdom, a third kingdom, followed by a fourth kingdom. And we saw when we unpacked it in that last lesson was we moved from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome to divided Rome or to Europe. And so that's the end of that image. So we want to talk about the stone. Who is this stone? What is this stone? And, and let's unpack that right now. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is a choice and precious in the sight of God. Verse 6, for this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Do you know who this is talking about? Yeah, that's exactly right. This is talking about Jesus Christ himself. He is that stone. He is that chief's cornerstone. Continue reading. Verse 7, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very corner stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. You see there in verse 8, it talks about stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, stone and rock interchangeable. Okay, so when we read in context stone, we can read rock, same thing, Christ Jesus himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 3, 4. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Look at that. Jesus Christ is the rock. We've got a great study, next study, in about the blue stone, and we'll unpack this particular scripture verse. Luke 20, verse 17. 
But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Jesus speaking. Verse 18, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Wow, look at the imagery happening in that particular verse. That stone, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces? What imagery does that remind you of? Yeah, it reminds you of Daniel 2. It says, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. That's exactly what happens in Daniel chapter 2. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, it says, it crushed it and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But that stone that struck the image, the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A couple more verses here. Look at Acts 4 verse 10. Pick it up in verse 11. He is the stone which the, was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Here's the key part of the verse, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. Salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Scriptures are beautiful here. Psalms 18 verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Last verse I want to point out here, Matthew 7. You know the story. Jesus talks about how those who um, act upon, hear and act upon my words may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, on Jesus Christ. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. You see, Jesus Christ is the rock. You know, we can face the rains, the winds, the tempests, but our foundation will not fall because it's built upon the rock. Those that don't build their house upon the rock. In verse 27, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now, some people will say, is the stone the first coming of Christ or the second coming of Christ? That's a good question. However, you have to look at the context of the flow of the scripture verses here. If you see on the screen, you'll see the world empires from Neo-Babylonian all the way to Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe, okay? Transition from the barbaric states through the Middle Ages to modern day Europe. It's not until you get to the feet of toes, the feet of iron and clay, that, you, that the image, the stone strikes the base of the image, okay? So this would be at the end. Some people will say, but didn't Christ say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? In Matthew 3, John the Baptist even says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Jesus would say in Matthew 4, verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, how is this not the kingdom when Christ came the first time? Didn't he establish his kingdom and his church at the day of Pentecost? Not exactly, especially not according to this particular timeline in Daniel chapter 2. But there is something interesting going on here, and I want to unpack that. Take a look at Luke 10, verse 8. Jesus speaking to his disciples, And whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. You might say, isn't the scriptures pointing to that the kingdom of God had come during the time of Jesus? One more verse. Luke 19 verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Okay, they think that God's kingdom is going to appear immediately. And so what does Jesus do? He tells them a parable. This is the parable he tells them. And he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. 
Now that parable, Jesus would be talking about himself. Jesus is the nobleman, okay? Jesus, after his resurrection, would go to a distant country, would go to a distant country, to heaven, receive a kingdom for himself, and then he would return. That's the second coming. He has to receive the kingdom first and then return. And this is exactly what we see happening in Daniel 7. In verse 13, it says this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. We're going to unpack this more in detail when we get to Daniel 7. I just want to get you to see this, that the Son of Man in Daniel 7 verse 13 is Jesus Christ. He comes up to the Ancient of Days, that's referring to God the Father. He's presented before him, and what happens in the verse? It says, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Remember, Jesus even says to Pilate in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Okay, Jesus would go to receive that kingdom in heaven and then return. However, what's interesting is this play on word or the close association between the Hebrew words stone and sun. Because if you take a look at the Hebrew word for stone, it's eben. If you take a look at the Hebrew word for sun, it's ben. You see that eben, ben? See, what's going on here is Christ is the stone, Christ is the kingdom, okay? So when Christ manifested himself in his first coming, he was the kingdom. The kingdom of God came near to us, okay? In the personhood of Jesus Christ, all right? But we're talking about when Christ returns a second time, physically manifests himself at the second coming, destroys all world kingdom systems and sets up God's kingdom that will endure forever and it won't be given to another people. And see, the kingdom of God is near to you right now, dear heart. The kingdom of God is near to us because when we accept Christ, when we accept that he has died for our sins and we surrender to him our lives as Lord and Savior, the kingdom of God dwells within us because Christ dwells within us. Beautiful scriptures here, okay? So this is what's happening. And that, that kingdom would grow into a great mountain, just like that mustard seed would grow into a great tree, okay? What's the mountain? It grows into that stone, grows into a great mountain. Isaiah 2 verse 2 says this, Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways. Okay, this is Mount Zion. This is God's heavenly kingdom. This is God's kingdom that will be established forever and ever. After Daniel tells the interpretation of this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar is blown away. In verse 46 of Daniel 2, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. Now that verse is amazing to me because King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't bow to anybody. He doesn't do homage to anybody. He is the king of Babylon. He has absolute authority and rule over everyone. He can raise one up. He can put one down. Now here, Daniel tells this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, interprets the dream. King Nebuchadnezzar is just on the edge of his seat, and now he realizes he's interacting with the Most High God. And it says this in verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Have you been counting along the number of times mystery appears in Daniel chapter 2? 
Yeah, you would have count eight times, it appears. And I only make that point in this broader sense because there's a mystery going on. And in Revelation 10 verse 7, it says this, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he was about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. We want to unpack what that mystery is. It's an amazing discovery in the Bible because the seventh trumpet has sounded. We'll unpack that when we get to Revelation. The mystery of God is finished. We're going to explain what is that mystery. Okay, it's a beautiful understanding of God is preparing his people because he is about to return. We're living in the final days. We are absolutely living in the final days. I just want to unpack a couple more things in terms of this metal man image. Let's go back to it. In verse 31, it says a great statue. Okay, it's, in, it's one great image. Take, take a look at the value of the metals in this picture here. What's happening to the value of the metals? If you move from gold to silver, from silver to bronze, from bronze to iron, iron to clay, what's happening to the value? Yeah, no question. You see a deterioration. You see a, a value going lower and lower and lower. Okay. Um, what else do you see here? Some would say that that would be a degradation, a fall in civilization. What else do you see here going on with these metals? How about the strength of the metals? What's happening to the strength of the metals? If you go from gold to silver, silver would be a bit stronger uh, than, than gold. Uh, bronze is a little bit more harder, right? Iron, much stronger, right? So you see a strength increasing in metals. Okay, deteriorating in value, but strength increasing. Many people would say this would be the military might of the kingdoms as you move down in succession. Rome crushed. Rome trampled. Rome destroyed everything in its wake. Most devastating empire. How about the density of the metals? Have you ever thought about that? Density of the metals? I mean, what you really have is you have a top-heavy metal man you're looking at. Gold is the most dense. Silver is a little bit less dense. Uh, bronze is less dense. Iron even less. Iron and clay even less. So you have a very top heavy figure here and that doesn't seem like it would be a stable figure. You don't build things that are top heavy. It's easy to topple over, which really emphasizes the point that world kingdom systems cannot last. They cannot endure, especially with a base of iron and clay. How about the types of metals? Okay. We really just covered that. I mean, we have the gold, I mean, what's the significance of gold? Okay, well, uh, gold in Babylonian times, I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar and those kings basically decorated their temples with gold, overlaid them with gold because it was about glory and splendor. But when you move to Medo-Persia, they're not so much about glory and splendor. They're about riches. Daniel 11 verses 1 and 2 would even point to that. Okay, they're about gathering money, collecting money, uh, raising money, gaining wealth. And silver would be representative of coins, of money exchange. If you go to bronze, though, significance of bronze, clearly pointing to the Greek empire. I mean, you have bronze shields, you have bronze helmets, you have bronze breastplates, you have even their chariots were overladen with bronze in terms of the wheels of their chariots and everything. Clearly pointing to Greece, Rome. Edward Gibbons, the famous historian, writes his book, The Fall of the Roman Empire in 1776, said the iron monarchy of Rome. I mean, Rome was just strong as iron. And this is what they, they, they had their iron shields and swords. Um, you move, so types are very interesting here. Um, what else do we see here? This is one great image, right? It's really an idol, okay? I mean, this is an idol. And it's something that is uh, an abomination to the Lord, right? God says, don't make any idols unto yourselves. Don't make it in heaven above, earth below, or the waters under. Don't make anything that would be an idol that you would worship, okay? And the place where people worship idols and images is at the feet. 
Okay, that's exactly where the stone would strike the image and completely destroy it. Uh, notice also uh, two more things, Transit, the transitory nature of these kingdoms. Okay, you move from Babylon, head of gold, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, Europe, very temporary kingdoms, okay, in the world scheme of things, but God's kingdom will endure forever. The last thing I point out about this image is the head, the head of gold. Remember, it's a single unit, okay? The head, as we know, the head controls the body, right? So the principles of Babylon would continue and permeate through these world kingdom systems in terms of not recognizing God and oppressing God's people, okay? That attitude of pride, we'll see when we get to Daniel 4, would permeate through these other world kingdom systems all the way down to the time of the end. Now, this last verse I want to point out to you is this, Romans 15 verse 4. Because you have to ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of prophecy? Why are we studying this? Okay, that's very interesting. We got a nice history lesson on the transitory kingdom and everything. But why is this important? It's important because prophecy gives us hope. Okay, prophecy gives us hope, hope for the future. Okay, we know what to look for. God is giving us an understanding of what is going to happen, what has happened, and what will happen. His return. That's beautiful. To have hope in the future? Romans 15 verse 4, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. You see, these scriptures are teaching us through perseverance we might endure, okay? And we'd hope in the future. See, you know, life can crush us just like this iron was crushing. And whatever we may be going through in life, whatever happens at work or with our families or in our marriages or in our personal life, whatever may happen, God is still the God of your life and He wants you to have hope. Okay, that's why prophecy was given to us. There is a God in heaven and he cares about you. Okay, he's giving you, a sparrow can't even fall to the ground, okay, without him knowing it. Can't even fall to the ground. You know, what was tough was we just lost our little dog. Um, Jamie had her for 11 years, much closer than I was to her. And um, we talked about this, that, you know, she taught us so many lessons and it was tough to lose her. She had a stroke. There was nothing we could do about it. Little Pomeranian and not even a sparrow can fall. And while it really touched our hearts and it hurt us, I know you may have lost a pet. Uh, they were part of the family, but not even a sparrow can fall. And we know that, you know, God saves man and beast. That's clear. And I think it's Psalms 37. But this is the beauty of what God, no matter what troubles we're going through and everything, God gives us hope through these scriptures. And our lives are just fleeting, temporary troubles that we go through. And Christ Jesus is returning and victory is certain for God's people. Beautiful study here. So in closing, um, I just want you to be encouraged by this, by this prophecy. Prophecy was given to us so that we might have hope and that we would be looking to the soon return of Christ Jesus. In the next study, we're going to cover a, a wonderful study about the blue stone, and we're going to unpack deeper truths about God's law, about Jesus Christ himself, and about God's throne. Let's close out in prayer. Father God, thank you for these scriptures, and we just thank you for your word, and that we know that Christ is returning. And give us hope and perseverance as we wait for him, his soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I find that very solid, huh? We've got stone, we've got great mountain. <laughs> yes. And uh, we were talking about great mountain just in yeah. the last session. And then we have all the different metals. <laughs> and all these metals can be found in the ground, right? Yeah. Huh? You dig for gold and so forth. 
And um, next week, we're going to talk about the blue stone. And those of you who may have already studied it, you have, you know, you can sure you can testify about how wonderful that blue stone study is. So do join us for the blue stone next week also. And so we started off talking about the stone, how Jesus is that stone. He is also the rock, right? And the cornerstone that many rejected at one time when they were building the temple, that cornerstone that was rejected, that stone that was rejected became the cornerstone, the most important stone. And you know, the stone will come and crush that image at the bottom. That's where people will kneel when they um, worship idols at the feet of the idols. That stone will come and destroy the feet, which will crumble the whole body. And a great mountain will result from that. All right. Any queries? Anything that you find interesting or um, worth commenting? He mentions that prophecy gives us hope. What do you think of that? What other things do prophecy, does prophecy give us? Well, think about this. <clears throat> if you were living thousands of years ago, right? if you were living before Moses wrote, the first five books. Everything at that point, before Moses wrote the five, first five books, were all prophecy because nothing has happened yet. Nothing much has happened yet. So a lot of people say, study prophecy, why? Why not? Because everything is prophecy depends on where you live, when you existed. Now, we, we kind of imagine now, like, oh, we're at the end of time. So a lot of it has happened. That's history, right? A lot of history has happened. So um, it's like there's nothing, there's nothing much more to happen. So no, no, no. We've got the, the New Testament. We've got uh, uh, the New Covenant. Why bother? And that's what, um, what was his name? <laughs> the, the famous uh, evangelist, uh, Rick, Warren. Rick Warren. That's exactly what Rick Warren said. Don't bother to study prophecy. But we've got to realize everything was prophecy from the very start. Mm -hmm. And prophecy is getting more and more crucial because it's the end of time. And recently, over the past two years, the study of prophecy has erupted because of unprecedented events. All right? So prophecy is very important. Yes, men shall run to and fro, not necessarily running with our feet, but running with our fingers to study the Bible so that we will know and understand the prophecies better. Well, like you said, before people had the first five books, they only have prophecies. And which is the first yeah. prophecy in the Bible? Isn't it Genesis 3.15 after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit that they were not supposed to? The first prophecy came in. And it was there to give them hope that there will be a Messiah coming, right? The, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And that prophecy was uttered by God himself to the serpent in the hearing of Adam and Eve. So it sure gave them hope. Yeah. <laughs> and if you are God's people, we should have prophecy to give us hope. So yeah. if we don't have prophecy, then we will be like the worldly person that just living this life. And then, oh, you have one life to live, live as best as you can. And then they will want to know the future. And so they will go to fortune tellers or um, uh, try to bet on this and that in uh, stock markets for, 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 for money purposes. So their money becomes their God. 
but we are prophetic because we are God's people. We want to not just know what is ahead of us, but we want to know what God has to say about prophecy that is going to affect not just us personally, but everything around us in the world. Okay, now the other thing is this. A lot of people say, oh, I mean, we've just heard that prophecy gives us hope, right? But a lot of people think, oh, prophecy is doomsday, darkness. And uh, don't study it because it is uh, doomsday. It, it is no hope. And it's completely the wrong picture. Okay, now, another thing. Think about Daniel. Daniel gives or interprets prophecy for the king. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel did that. Now, for us, as we study prophecy and when we know prophecy, are we going to witness prophecy to kings? Or are we just going to share with friends? Okay, you know, the Bible says <clears throat> that the prophecy of the end of time will go to every kindred tongue and nation. Now, nations are governments, kings. That's how the Bible expresses nations, kings. All right, so the prophetic proclamation of Revelation 14 goes to nations, either in, in other words, kings. Now, when would kings listen to you and I? When would they be paying particular attention to you? Well, at the time of the end, the kings will unite with the Roman church, the heel Roman church, and they will push forward a sign of unity, of religious unity, a sign of worship, 666. And when you stand up, because you understand prophecy, because you're convicted, and reject 666, that's when nations will listen to you. They may not accept it, but you'll become a tremendous witness of the prophecy of God. And when it happens, and when God judges against the nations or kings, it may be too late for them. And they would have wished that they had listened to you. So we must broaden our uh, anticipation of what will happen. You know, yes, we will witness to friends. Yes, we will witness to family. But finally, God's people will witness to nations. That's the big picture. That's why we bring, bring us back to Daniel. Daniel was nobody uh, captured. He witnessed because he knew prophecy from God and witnessed to Nebuchadnezzar and converted him. Now, I'll tell you this story. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, um, a uh, I, I'll name him. His name is Norm Franz. And I think um, one of you um, knows him, right? Norm Franz was a, a do, doing prophecy, and he predicted the fall, the Asian crisis. And after the crisis, Indonesia heard about him. They flew him out in a jet plane, had Mercedes there to fetch him, so that the Indian, the Indonesian government, top-level governments, listened to what he had to say after the event. Okay, this is a, a true story. This is Norm France. Okay, and, and he's still a, a, a preacher today. Yeah. So here it is, that don't reduce your expectations of how God can empower you. That's the power of prophecy.
I'm looking at the verse in 1 Peter 3.15 that says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So here we have a reason for the hope and we talk about prophecy giving us hope. So we have the reason for the hope being the reason for the prophecies that we believe in also, right? So we need to understand prophecies. We need to interpret it correctly so that the hope that we have is well-founded. So that we, the hope that we have is not on um, sandy ground, but rather on solid rock. You know, when the, the, when the disciples did not understand the prophecies thoroughly, they thought Jesus was going to come and build uh, the earthly kingdom there and then. Now today, we have prophecies that are being interpreted differently. And some people expect the, the rapture, some don't. Some um, have different interpretations of uh, the, the coming of Christ. Is it going to be quiet? Is it going to be... Um, every eye shall see him. So we need to understand prophecy so that we know how to, uh, what to expect so that we don't end up receiving the wrong Christ. Christopher. Ah, yeah, I, I just want to make a comment. I think... Oh, you got muted. What happened? You spoke halfway and you got muted. <laughs> I put my Bible on my computer, so it, I have to be pressed. <laughs> no, I was just saying that uh, I would just like to qualify for myself saying that um, it's more to me a biblical prophecy that we need to understand. You know, I mean, in that term, the use of the term, because um, we are at the stage of a uh, haven't seen a lot of this prophecy that we have gone through from Daniel, Ezekiel, and so on, being fulfilled, you know. We, we, I mean, some of us has gone through all this, which give us, and which give me more confidence in trying to understand, you know, the hope that we have hoped for, the, the event that is to be coming. So with that understanding, I think Christians or believers or followers of Christ is in a more comfortable stage of facing the future event. Therefore, the hope is very important here. We know exactly what is going to happen because uh, we already experienced or seen through history that all the biblical prophecy is fulfilled right to the dot. Mm -hmm. And it is not a hearsay, it is not a, it will happen and it did not happen, but it has already happened. So give us that more confidence. So prophecy, studying prophecy to me, recently it's becoming a very important issue. And that's where the hope is coming in. You know, among the love, hope and favor, hope is the what we are aiming, the hope for the second coming of Christ. Which, as we have, you have just said, there are so many different views, uh, opinions of what it is. But let us not be, uh, con I mean, be uh, worried about that because, you know, we've, earlier, we, in earlier session, we did mention about pre-trip, whatever, and so on. But when we start to understand, for me, the, the more into the biblical prophecy, things become clearer. And it is not uh, what, what I, I understand that uh, there is no, it's more confident in facing the future. You know, the financial, like Norm Franks, yeah, yeah, I know him personally also, uh, Kokto. He has yeah. been here quite a few times on financial and all this. He is the one that I also listened to last time. He actually showed us that microchips, you know, bringing it along and so on. That time when I listened to it, it was quite fearful, you know. <laughs> but that is already passed. Uh. What I'm trying to say at this stage now, 
I think for all of us, our brothers and sisters here listening, uh, or we are sharing with each other, it's so important to understand biblical prophecy, not just a prophecy of knowing the future, because all other religions will talk about this and all, you know, but we are being encouraged now in the sense that most of the biblical prophecy is being fulfilled, and we got the advantage of seeing that has been done, and it is not just a hearsay, but it's a historical event. So it, we are, our hope is actually on the rock, very strong foundation, and we should pursue it, and we should be understanding, learning together more and more. You know, that, that's why I want to you know, communicate. So biblical prophecy, not just any prophecy. <laughs> you know, prophecy is so loosely used nowadays. Oh, what? Uh, reading the future and so on. No, 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 no. Let's go back to the Bible. It's all stated there. Wa. You remember Amos, isn't it? God will not let Allah it happen unless he has revealed it. So our duty, our responsibility is to find out this treasure in the book. How? Read the word of God, sharing like what we are doing now. Because I think, I believe God will give to each one of us that zigzag puzzle. I like to see everybody, God has given a, a zigzag piece. So now we are piecing it together and helping each other to form his picture, not our picture, not my picture. Yeah. So the biblical prophecy will really give us that hope. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's one version of the Bible which quoted Amos and it said, God will do nothing yeah. unless he first reveals it. All right. That's the words I'm referring to. Yes. yes. <laughs> he first reveals it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the important thing. Yeah. So it gives us confidence. It gives us hope. It, it gives us a. a, a a GPS, Correct. we can reach our destination, mm. right? Because Although it may make a, a, a wrong turn, it yeah. will say U-turn, go forward 200 yards and make a U-turn. <laughs> yeah. We have to follow the right signs. Like just now we were studying in Revelation 13, right? The signs can be changed. You know, if you are going in, uh, following the GPS or, you know, I mean, sometimes the GPS is faulty and we have to follow the road signs or whatever. But if some naughty fellow turned the sign the other way, <laughs> the high king or something, and you're already lost and somebody still turned the sign the other way, you will really be lost, right? We are all here on this earth looking for, right now, Christians, looking for the, the way, right? But if we have been misled, wow, we better watch out. And there are a lot of prophecies which turn the signs the wrong way. <laughs> Counterfeit. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just thinking, you know, do we know what is the counterfeit? We actually know that Satan has a lot of um, counterfeits, right? He's a copycat. He's a really... Uh, good at everything uh, when there is a truth there is also a counterfeit so if we don't know the bible well enough we may just know one of it and when we know one of it how do we know that we are not no uh, we're not getting the counterfeit truth okay so we got to study until we need to know two and choose which is the right one let me ask some of you who have studied with us for a while, okay? Um, which signpost have you discovered as you study with us? And you say, oh, I've got more confidence now. Which signpost have you discovered that would turn the other way to mislead? None? Rephrase. Yeah, for me, I think I'm beginning to place more emphasis on the commandments of God, which I, in a way, in a sense, took a bit lightly in the sense that, you know, uh, not so much about the grace is insufficient for me, but that's very important also. So what really for me now is that the law actually is Jesus Christ himself, which I have not really understood then, but now I'm beginning to slowly more and more unpack as I go through the series of studies with you guys, you see. So mm -hmm. I, I think that the signpost, everything we read, it pointing us to Jesus and that Jesus 
is the way, the truth and the light, which uh, it is expressed in uh, many different forms. But for me, that is the direction. Because uh, if you go, as you say, some uh, there are so many people trying to play with that direction, the GPS, uh, you may go wrong way and then get to the wrong place. Is it? But then we to be guided back by the Ten Commandments, the, the rules. That is why Jesus has simply said, I have fulfilled it and now the golden rules, I think it was in James, right? Uh, love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, which is the first four commandments. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which is the other six to ten. I mean, uh, five, to, five to ten, right? So actually this encompasses all. So Jesus did not abolish it, but he fulfilled it. With him to fulfill it, it is easier for us now. Mm -hmm. To, to, okay. to obey and to leave it out, that commandment, which is that signpost to, for me. La. Okay, that's great. Okay, now, maybe uh, the, the, fo uh, the following, the follow-up question is like, how were these signposts mis changed somewhat? How, what, what, did the pe what did people teach about the law that, that, that nuance that would de-emphasize it? Well, what happened? What, what did we hear? And where did it come from? Anybody? Who's responsible for it? <laughs> no, I mean, where did it come from? What's where the did it come from? I mean, this is what we encounter all the time if you talk about the law. Um, yeah, yeah, like we already saved. Uh, uh, why do we need the law? Are you saying we're not saved? You know, like, yeah, like, like. Uh, Oh, but uh, we, we thought the law was for the Jews. Uh, it's legalism. And uh, where did all that come from? Is it an error? All right. Uh, 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 innocent error. Or is it placed there by the adversary? And placed in institutions of higher learning? placed in maybe you know universities of liberal thought of philosophy humanism uh, you're okay i'm okay uh, that kind of liberalism human philosophy or was it actually placed in seminaries all of the above or is it a combination of humanistic thought and seminaries? It's slightly all of the above. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, it is. You know, uh, we're going to be studying Revelation 2 and 3 or 1, 2, 3 in a, in a couple of weeks after we finish Revelation 14 with the earlier groups. Okay, those of you who are with us on the Saturday, 4.30. Next week, we'll be studying Revelation 14 and the Sunday, 2 p.m. also. And the following week, we will be studying the seven churches, okay, or we will do the first four, which talks about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, many people debate about it, and many people still do not know what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, we are talking about seminaries, and where did all these come from? You know? It started right there. And as we study the seven churches, I will be going into the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which is precisely what we are talking about, where the law of God, which Christopher, now you know, is precious, is being put down because grace is elevated. Yeah, it's been watered down, yes. Yes. So next week... Those, false grace is yes, elevated. Okay, grace, not, 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 not grace. False grace. Okay, grace is elevated to the point where they put away the law. And so 
That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We can show it in the Bible. And I would like to encourage all of you to, to join us, as well as, of course, next week, because we'll be studying the blue stone, which upholds the law, and you will find and learn so much about it. You will find that the Old Testament and the New Testament is so closely linked, you cannot take it apart and say this is old-fashioned. You'll find that really Jesus is the law. Jesus is the word. The, he is the word we know from James, I mean, John 1. And you'll find right here, Jesus is the stone. He is the rock. He is the Ten Commandments. He's everything. And don't you want to embrace all of him? So let's study that next week. And in the meantime, we have a question here from Yu Feng Sham that says, thank you, Kokto and Roxana. Enjoyed the learning. Oh, okay. You have to leave now. Okay, fine. And um, we have uh, time for some more questions. q and I, I want to give another thought. Since we're on this, right? If Jesus had attended the school of the rabbis and went through the process and graduated from the school of the rabbis and then declared that he was the Messiah, he would be accepted. But because he came from nowhere, <laughs> although he was studying the biblical writings or the OT, he was rejected. So, it, it, I mean, I hope you agree with me. Because there is a hierarchy, there is a recognized process, and the hierarchy and the recognized process, in, even in his days, were dominated by men. So not only did, was Jesus not, did not go to the school of the rabbis, neither did John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. So think about it. Um, if the school of the rabbis <laughs> were dominated by a hierarchy of thinking, uh, what about... Uh, today's dominating seminaries around the world in relation to human thought, in relation to um, legal processes, right? particularly the US and, 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 and the top uh, judicial body of the US, uh, who were, where were these men educated? You know, Protestant, we Protestants came from the Roman church. Of course, the Roman hierarchy, <laughs> the Roman seminaries, right, today have educated 66% uh, of the chief justices of the, U of the US of A. I mean, this, we're talking about law, okay? Seminaries talk about the law, the law. So canon law, that was the, that's the basis of Western civilization. So what we're seeing is a tremendous uh, network of power between humanistic thought and religious hierarchies. Okay? So uh, people will say, <laughs> people will ask us or you as you speak, what is your authority? Uh, uh, have you got a doctorate? Have you got a PhD in theology? If not, you may not be worth listening to. Now, at the time of the end, when uh, I'm sure a debate will arise on institutionalized of a day of worship, because it has to go to the courts of the law. It has to go into constitutional courts. And men of learning and men of, um, of, of, of with, with titles will decide whether it's constitutional or not to impose a day of worship. And it will be supported by governments. So think about it. 
how above us are institutions that will dominate us with double PhDs and theological degrees and thousands of years of learning. Who in the Bible had all those degrees and had to unlearn them all before God could use him? <laughs> Anybody can tell me? Who yeah. in the Bible? That must be uh, sour Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one. That's okay. one. Okay. Paul, you're okay. right. He's a well learned guy, and then when yeah. Jesus, by His grace, bring him back. Oh, <laughs> he was Pharisee of the Pharisees yeah. under the feet of Gamaliel, and he had to <laughs> unlearn and throw them all because it was causing him to persecute and kill. Who else? Who else? <laughs> Way, way back at the beginning of the Bible. Mui. No, I was thinking about the New Testament, about Luke, the doctor. Oh. Tell us about Luke, the doctor. He's a medical doctor. Eh? Uh. Okay, he's a physician. So he was trained and he had to be retrained for the word of God. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. okay. Um, can we can you tell us? I know you have very good Bible knowledge. I'm thinking of somebody whose name starts with the same alphabet as yours. <laughs> H. Hmm? Oh, you okay. You mean H E N G? Yeah. Start with start with Mui. <laughs> no, start with M. M. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, start with M. M. Let me see. Matthew. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. I know. I you know, mean I know. Old Testament or New Testament? Old Testament. Is, is it? Is it? Uh, may I? May I? Uh, what is? Okay. Is it? Okay. Uh, sorry. What did you say? Oh, I don't know his name. Esther's. Uh, Esther's. Uh, Uncle. <laughs> Mordecai. Mordecai. No, 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 I'm not no. referring to Mordecai. No, uh. your turn. Who you want to guess? <laughs> Start with M. <laughs> Moses. <laughs> Moses is very well learned Moses. from the Pharaoh. <laughs> now, how about Sal? Were you going to say Moses too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I still think it's Moses. No. Uh. <laughs> yes, I'm thinking of Moses. Who wants to tell us about Moses? What do you know about Moses that he had to unlearn them all? He was trained to be the successor to be the next pharaoh. He was trained in all the, the royal, the court things, you know, the knowledge and all those. He was the pharaoh's sister's uh, son, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pharaoh's sister, the princess, adopted Moses, trained yeah. him with all the wisdom of Egypt. Yes. And God prepared him to lead the holy people out of slavery, out of Egypt into the promised land. But before he did that, he had to he had to be in the wilderness to be trained up, looking right. after his father in lordship. How many years? <laughs> 40 years, I think so. Oh, wow, 40 years. <laughs> so he was 40 years in Pharaoh's court. And 40 years to unlearn what he learned here. And 40 and years me, you know? in the wilderness because the Israelites were very stubborn. So he had to now look after sheep and learn to be poor. <laughs> I, think, I think he has been well prepared by God. Yes, you see, the things that the world has, okay, although, you know, Pharaoh's court was um, secular, uh, let me do all of you. I don't know where the noise is coming from. Um, so the things that Moses learned, although it was in a secular court, he had to unlearn them all. He thought he could use his uh, military power and lead Israel out of Egypt. But God had a different plan for him. That's not the way. He's not going to like, kill the Egyptians that way to lead uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. God had to teach him reteach him, help make him unlearn all those things until he almost forgot how to speak the Egyptian language, right? And teach him 
things that will really make him a useful servant of God. You see, we were talking about John the Baptist and Jesus. If they had, like Paul, when he was Saul, learn under the rabbinical teachers, what do you think would have become of them? They might have been so corrupted, so pharisaical, that the truth can't go into the ears. Because Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. And these disciples were looking up to the Pharisees. What? They are so righteous. If, if we have to surpass them, wow, you know, it's beyond our reach. What do we do? But what Jesus was saying is, don't follow that, that example. Yes, they may be teaching you the right things, but not their example, okay? But of course, they were teaching many wrong things too. That's why they ended up crucifying Jesus. You see, we need to get our learning from God himself, from the word of God. We must not think so highly of the Pharisees, so highly of the theological seminaries and colleges that we disregard studying the word of God for ourselves. And to we, add on, uh, hmm. sorry. Carry on. Uh, actually, our Bible also tells us uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, uh, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. So how smart or how wise a person is on earth uh, is foolishness to God. So yeah. we have to come to God, uh, empty everything what we know and relearn from the God Almighty. I think as when we come to God, I think mm. humility is the main thing because if you think you know everything mm. and that's the thing that you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> the more we <laughs> learn to know more, we should realize that there's so much we don't know, right? Uh, sometimes when we learn also, we learn the wrong things and then you thought it's the right thing. That is the worst thing. <laughs> and I, I, I feel it like learn everything. <laughs> uh, you, we have to unlearn and relearn, you see. So the best thing is to learn from God Himself and from the Holy Spirit and from the Bible. And like what Brother Cocteau say, yeah, when Jesus came, uh, he was rejected because people cannot accept his background. See, the world is such uh, even right now, don't talk about Christianity. We talk about the corporate world. People look, hey, where is this guy come from? Let's say go for interview. Hey, this guy come from which university? Uh? Uh, what, what, what credential he has? Uh? All this, you know, the world is so set in this system. Uh, they look at even the preacher. Uh, hey, this preacher, how long? Uh, where, which church? Uh, which covering this and that? They, they fail to see that whether whatever that person is preaching, uh, is it the word of God or is it from his? You know, sometimes I'm not condemning any pastor. Sometimes when they they teach or they preach, huh, it must be led by the Spirit, which I think will be very good. Instead of, maybe they have all the sermon writ written, huh, that it just come out like as though you are giving a talk, you know. I, I feel it that way, like, I don't know. So therefore, all of us, huh, I mean, when we come to God, we come in humility and say, Lord, I don't know anything. I just want to learn from you. I want to know the truth and the truth will set us free. Mm -hmm. That's my take, la. Yes. Okay, but, but the other thing is like this. Okay, a lot of us have put ourselves as uh, obedient and listeners and sit in the pews. Okay, uh, we don't open our Bible. We listen to a preacher or a pastor, and we feel that oh, that's enough. Okay, now. Very often when we speak to people, they will say, oh, Mr. A says this, Mr. B says this. But they don't ever say the Bible, you know, chapter what, verse what says that. They, they, they don't. 
So it's about being a listener. Who says what? Okay. Now that that's Christianity. So that when they hear something new, they will they don't know where to look because they they have not cultivated the habit of looking at the word of God themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the next thing if they hear something new that they, they mm, not comfortable with? What do they do? It may be truth, but they're not comfortable. What do they do? When you we are like, should, when we you, should check the Bible. We go back to the Bible, check the Bible and cross references. But yes. from my experience, some of the preachers, if you question them, they are not happy. They think that they are the authority. Yes. Just like Sabbath. They're so they just cut you. It is Sunday. Everybody is practicing. So that's it. Conversation and the closure. <laughs> yeah. So once you don't know the, the word yourself, what happens is this. You will look to an authority, a person you know. You have put yourself mentally under the authority of another. And that's not how God works with you, you know. You have, you have uh, how shall I say, you have shortchanged yourself that you can understand the word of God. Most, most of them don't really think, you know, Kokto. they just go to church, listen to, to the word of God, they come back. In, in fact, after that, you meet them for lunch, ask them, what is the word of God? Oh, very good, very interesting. Why is it? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we've put ourselves mentally in that framework of who we are. We sit and we listen. That's it. But we don't study. We don't understand. One so way this direction is, only. This is listen. a very dangerous thing, you know. Mm. Okay. okay. And, yeah, we've reduced we've reduced our own potential to understand the word of God from the word of God from God Himself by revelation for ourselves. Understand it for ourselves. Okay, let's okay. pray. Father in heaven, whatever we have talked about, Lord, we pray that Your Holy Spirit will interpret it. Your you know our hearts, you know our strength, you know our weaknesses. We pray, Lord, that you will impress upon each and every one of us the truth that you want us to uphold, the truth that you want to strengthen us with, that we may be your better witnesses. And when the night is dark, the stars shine brightest. So may we shine for you wherever we go. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen and thank you. <laughs> okay, welcome. Bye-bye.